Welcome in. It's going to be a weird, wacky day. I'll go ahead and let you know this, guys, because uh, we're filming on not our standard day. But ABB, how are you feeling today? I am doing well. It is Wednesday. It is wacky. And thanks, everybody, again, who joined me for the live. More of you joined in. That was great. We had a ton of technical difficulties with the live commenting and everything, but we made it work. We had some fun. We threw. We almost hit a van. It was real. So it's been a great day. Had a fun week, Robbie. We had an opportunity to go. And uh, it's funny because we, this has been the week of like weird happenings so far. So this is kind of funny. But Monday, um, the city of Lynchburg schools reached out to us and said, hey, we have a uh, school like wellness day where they, everyone gets out for half a day. And so we're like, okay, cool. So me and Hunter and Trevor are like, yeah, great. We'll go teach some kids how to play disc golf. They said they had like 30 people sign up or whatever. I'm like, great. It's at Peaks View. We'll go play some disc golf, teach some kids how to play disc golf. So we get there. We're in the parking lot, and there's just like teachers around. And then we slowly realize that there's no kids here. This is only teachers. <laughs> so, which was fun. It was great. It was still fun. Um, it was a, it was a, just a different experience than we thought. Um, we got to teach some teachers and faculty members how to play some disc golf got to play with uh uh ken brand who uh we work with here locally he's a music teacher at uh one of the height of the middle schools but he started a disc golf program because there's um sandusky is like right down the road from their school yeah um so foundation and atlas have donated some stuff and helped them out and everything and i got that so we've known each other for a while but we finally got to play around together so that was fun and i had a new teacher call me coach the whole time so that was fun um, come on but he went from not being able to throw a frisbee to he like i think parred out at the end so he, he did let's well. go shout out javier dude yeah i it's funny i think there's actually a very real chance that i've met ken before um I, you 100 percent have because yeah like i was playing at sandusky with josh and dakota and like yep. then he we said, saw this he like, said that story he told yeah. me that exact story yep <laughs> that is funny the, how the world yeah the i guess the kids were like freaking out because they watch your your videos and stuff um yeah that's so, so funny the kid the guy who doesn't live in lynchburg <laughs> yeah. yeah what that's really funny but hey that's again the week of weird happenings but no it was cool it was it was a lot of fun and i don't know it's always good um those rounds i mean it's peak view i shot like four or five under i think five under oh. um but I missed seven birdie putts inside of 20 feet. So that was a little painful. Um, hey. But I don't know. I think going out in those scenarios makes me realize like what I love about disc golf is like I love the community. I love teaching people like I'm, I'm not in a posi- position to teach people, but like introduce them, I guess, like that introductory to disc golf. So yeah. that was I don't know. It's a lot of fun. And there was a, a guy, Ken's brother, actually from New Jersey uh, came down. So he got to play and. It was cool. He had a pioneer that was like pretty beat up. So I gave him mine um, to take home. And it, it was just cool. He's a foundation fan. He's a Robbie C fan. And Dude, I don't know. I, I'm here for it. I, I needed a good, like solid, like remember why you love disc golf day. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I'll tell you, dude, it's like as someone who records content on a regular basis and records content while like teaching and having a conversation and trying mm-hmm. to do all that, uh, like I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like, I don't think people realize that when your mind is so focused elsewhere, literally it's only two options are your body realizes how to actually do the thing. Mm -hmm. So turning your brain off makes putting like way easier. Or there are people who it's like, no, in order for you to find your best putting success, you got to be dialed in even on the easy ones or the inside ones. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're like out there teaching people how to play, having conversations the whole time, makes total sense on why those like inside 20 footers were like whacking all over you yeah but hey it was still a good time and i i'm really i don't know just the cool parts we get to do so hey if you're having a rough time playing disc golf and just take some buddies out or someone who's never played and just show them disc golf and you're like ah i remember this this is why i love this yeah and speaking of things that i remember and love you want to jump into today's sponsor yeah let's go let's hear from robbie for from mudwater We want to take a quick moment to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Mudwater. 
Believe it or not, I'm not the most friendly person in the morning, much more of a night owl, and I find myself often in early mornings searching for that energy alternative, and mud water has been a fantastic solution so that I'm not crashing later throughout the day or finding jitters from heavy amounts of caffeine. Now, there are plenty of reasons to choose mud water. Some people prefer it for the taste. For instance, you can mix it up with oat milk or honey, which take it to that next level beyond its already fantastic taste, or you can simply choose it for its healthy ingredients. I know the mix of fantastic ingredients with several mushrooms being mixed in for a variety of reasons. I love the cordyceps as it promotes natural energy because like I said, well, this is manufactured things and all the other different energy drinks and coffee and soda options out there do lead to that inevitable crash. And the cordyceps inclusion absolutely takes us so that we're not fearing the afternoon and we can still be productive with the rest of our days trying to get video and content out to you. Because after all, Mudwater is a healthy habits brand that's built on being a coffee alternative so that you can use the four natural ingredients that make up the primary blend of this drink to help you find that energy you're looking for to get the lifestyle that you're looking for. Plus, if you find yourself on a diet or any restrictions like that, Mudwater slots in perfectly because it's Whole30 approved, it's 100% USDGA certified organic, it's vegan, kosher, gluten-free, it's a fantastic product that is completely restriction-free. Plus, something that's going under the radar is that Mudwater supports psychedelic research and they have been doing this monthly since day one. They believe the country is in a mental health epidemic and one of the best ways to help treat these mental health conditions is through psychedelic assisted therapy. So Mudwater is hooking up our viewers with a beautiful coupon opportunity. A discount code is available to you if you head over to mudwater.com slash foundation. That's M-U-D-W-T-R.com slash foundation and you can get Mudwater for you for less than a dollar per cup per day. Y'all, this is a steal. So make sure you head over to mudwater.com and all of these amazing benefits can be yours. Uh, welcome. Welcome in. Gus, you're coming on the backside of an ad read. So uh, the world is so excited to have you here. Uh, and you like mud water, Gus? <laughs> yeah, you, are you a coffee yes. guy, Gus? <laughs> I am a coffee guy. I'm not a mud water guy. I haven't tried it yet. No, the okay. correct answer is you are a mud water. Oh, mud guy. water is yes. great. You mud water is great. Foundation. No, uh, <laughs> we are so excited, Gus, to have you here, man. Um, Gus, am I getting this correct that you're in Georgia? I am. Yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I I grew up in Atlanta, uh, and when I say I grew up in Atlanta, like classic, I lived outside the perimeter, but just what? outside the perimeter, so still Atlanta. Are you Atlanta proper? Like, are you in the perimeter? Oh, I am ITP. I'm in Decatur, but okay. I, I grew up outside the perimeter, too. I was up in Woodstock, so. Okay, I love it. I love it. I'm actually playing a tournament in Georgia in a week and a half uh, down in Griffin, so. Sweet. Yeah, I Georgia golf is great golf. Perkerson is iconic uh, Perkerson for so many reasons. If you let it, man, Perkerson will it'll beat you up. Uh, oh man, there's so <laughs> many good courses at La uh, Little Mulberry, uh, ER, or ERP. Yeah, East Roswell. Uh, that was my, yeah. my home course for a, a long time. I lived right nearby. I went to leagues every week, and and that's another one that'll it'll punish you if you play good. Oh, yeah. It'll it'll treat you nice, but if you don't, it'll it won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that will, that gives me immediate insight. Brad is familiar with woods golf. Virginia has a good amount of woods golf. Um, yep. but I would say Georgia, because it's like, it has so many courses. I feel like you can really find whatever suits your game. You want short little pitching putts. They exist. Um, the hard part with Georgia golf to me is that you're driving like 25 minutes minimum basically to get to any course unless you just happen to live next to one um so uh i stoked to hear that that gives sort of some context there but mm -hmm. gus we want our people to get to know you uh not just georgia golf in general so how long have you been playing disc golf so i've owned a disc since 2016 uh I, my brother went out to to waco texas for college came back and says oh you, you got to try this game and I'm, fine okay whatever so we went out maybe twice a year until about 2019 that's when i started to kind of get a little more into it you know had the chance to play more got more discs than the two that i had i had a dx shark and an avr and that was about it um then from there you know i, I hate to say i'm a covid golfer but that's really when i had the time to start really getting into it right. and taking yeah. it seriously uh so my first tournament was 
right at the start of 2020. And okay. then that's when it kind of took off of like, Hey, this is something I can really turn into a hobby. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm enjoying hearing more and more the two like life stages that seem really the most interesting are like, we are now far enough away from COVID that <laughs> we are getting people who are like, yeah, I started in 2023. I've been playing for like six months. That's awesome. Uh, like, I'm glad that we're still seeing new people come in or yeah, the stories of I knew about it and then COVID really launched me into it. Um, so excited to hear that. Now, Gus, let's say we put you out in a field and we're like, we're going to put this basket X amount of feet away from you. Uh, how can what distance can you consistently reach with a backhand and a forehand? Good day with the backhand. I'm hitting 290, 300. Um, okay. there, there are days that sometimes the form isn't all clicking together and I'll leave it out to about 260, but most of the time I'd say I can get it out 290 ish, uh, forehand. I trust my forehand. It's, it's consistent, but it's not very far. Okay. <laughs> so I'd, I'd say, you know, 190, 200 with the forehand, if I give it a full rip, and I'm, I, I use it a lot for approaches, you know, like I trust it. I just yeah. don't off the tee rarely use a forehand. Yeah. It'd have to be like the perfect hole that's inside that exactly. range. Exactly. Putt type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Uh, I, I love the way you word that Gus and like, I trust it. It just doesn't go very far because I think a lot of people should have more trust in their forehand because they can make it happen. Um, I brought my like Patreon into town uh, and I had them throw 125 foot forehands and so many people rolled their eyes at me. Like, I can't believe you're making me do this. And I was like, just trust me, like pick the right disc. And I bet you can throw a forehand 125 feet. It may not land as accurately as we need it to for this game, but like I, you also, if you've never thrown it, we can't expect it to go amazing. So that's, mm -hmm. That's really cool. Uh, that 125 foot range. I trust my forehand more than I do my backhand as far as placement. Yeah. You know, if, if I'm in a, an open field and I've got that 125 foot, I'm going forehand every time just because okay. the backhand, obviously I can get it there, but the, the power control isn't quite as consistent mm. as it is with the forehand. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, and I'm going to be very curious when we get down there, which, which of your discs you're using <laughs> for those forehands. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause I've got a couple ideas, but the water seemed very cloudy uh, in that area. So I'm excited for you to bring some clarity for us. Uh, all right. Let's talk putting. Put you on the putting green and we're like, hey, you got 10 putts from 15 feet, 10 putts from 25, 10 putts from 40 feet. How many are you making at each station? Yeah, putting's a strong suit of mine. Uh, if I am 10 out of 10 from 15, if I'm not 10 out of 10, I'm kicking myself. Um, 25, I'd like to say eight, you know, eight, nine-ish. Um, I'm not beating myself up quite as much as I've missed a 15 footer, but 45, it drops pretty dramatically because I don't have a, 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 a step putt or a jump putt that I trust. Okay. So I'd say four. Yeah. Are you more of a spin putter or push putter? Push putter. Pretty hybrid. Okay. Yeah. Almost, almost fully push putting. I try and put some spin on it, especially out of the 45, but it's, it's all arm motion for me. Yeah. 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 And that makes sense at 45, like mm -hmm. a 45 foot push putt is a haul. Yeah, you got to put it, some, got to put some mustard on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it always makes me, it's, I love Vinny, but by golly, is it like the, I I'll never forget. It's, it seems to always happen at him to him at Vegas is like, he'll have like a 20 footer that he misses and then uphill and it'll roll back to like 45 or 50. And he's just like, and bank. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Bro, you didn't even step. What are you doing? Uh, right. uh, okay. So, and that brings us to our final question, which you kind of tease there. What would you say is the biggest strength of your game? Yeah, definitely putting. Um, that's just, it's, it's something last year I took the entire year defining a pre putt routine just mm. to make sure that it's gotten consistent. I've watched a lot of YouTube videos on, Hey, here's some, some helpful tips. And from those videos, I didn't take any, you know, one person's routine, one person's form, but I kind of took like, Oh, I should be thinking about this. I should be putting my weight shift here. Um, you know, random tips, like putting your left arm behind your back or further back in your stance. And that kind of developed that routine for me. So last year I went from a mediocre putter to someone that I think is above my field with putting. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Uh, 
and that that kind of takes me back to Brad. You were talking about uh, before you came in today, Gus. We were telling how the week's been going, and Brad talked about he played around with some uh, teachers and missed a bunch of inside twenty footers. Uh, and Seven I don't say that to time. like. Uh, I don't birdie. say that to All like make birdie. fun of it. There it just, go. we talk, I talked about like, you're talking, you're conversing and all that. I'm sure that pre-shot normal putt routine, none of it felt normal. Cause you probably on some of those probably even still kept the bag on because it was just like, Oh, we got to keep going. Cause we're playing slow kind of a deal. Yeah. Or I was like literally saying, okay, well you want to do this or you want to try to do this. And this is what these fingers are supposed to do. And then of course I miss it. Right. So that's a great example. But yeah, I was pretty much talking the entire time I was putting. So that that helps. But I think the positive there, though, Robbie, is like I had that many birdie putts. So I'm like, I'm making some better choices and being a little more. I will say I was very accurate off the tee. So that's that's helpful. Which Um, I feel like when you're playing with new people, that is way harder to showcase than like. I don't think new players have still got a grat. Like if you hit like five twenty five footers in a row, a new player that doesn't feel that impressive, like watching it yeah now doing it doing it is entirely different but for them they're probably wild more wild like wow man this guy this guy had seven birdie putts that he even missed those like that's crazy yeah but it's funny too because i like i know who i am and i'm sure anybody that's like a ma3 player knows who you are but like when a new player comes along and you're, you're showing them disc golf you like they think you're like a superstar and because like hole six robbie at peaks i parked it i was like I was like, hey, and I was telling him about different types of discs. I was like, okay, well, here's like a Halo Leopard 3. It's more understable. That means it goes right. I'm going to throw it here because this slopes to the left. And I throw it and I park it. And he's like, man, you got to just like be the best around. I'm like, you don't even, I'm not even the, the I'm not even close to the top 60% of the best around. Uh, but it is cool. It is fun. Um, but no, it's cool hearing a, a really good putter because I really feel like coming back to the bingo card, Robbie, every. It seemed like this this phase in people's game, it's like, hey, approach shots are my strength. Approach game is my strength. And it's good to hear that you're recognizing probably pretty early on that I know you've been playing since 2020 or whatever, but still you're like, okay, I need to really develop this putt game. And that's like the least fun that there is, in my opinion, is just out there and just like bang putts and pay attention to where your hands are and where your feet are for hours at a time. So it's exciting to hear um, your putting and like that's come such a long way to you. Do you play a lot of tournaments, Gus? I try to. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, as Robbie said, there's a ton of courses around here, mm-hmm. and there's a really active community of tournament directors. Mm-hmm. So there's pretty much something going on every weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, do I, you do you do well? I mean, do you do well against people? Because I feel like, do you play MA three or MA two? MA three. Um, <laughs> the biggest reason I don't play MA two is because that's a lot of the time where the jump happens from short tees to long tees, and yeah. long tees are terrifying. Yeah, I hear um, that. but mostly MA three, and it's it's a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't want to say we have a lot of sandbaggers around here, but eh. you know, I've I've had a couple of tournaments that I've gotten second place and lost by eight strokes. Oof. Yeah, but it's yeah. tough. But the you, uh, the other you... part, I'm going back to you talking mm-hmm. about putting. I also got really fortunate, and I changed jobs in 2022, and then my work has a course four minutes away from it. Oh, that's nice. And so it's gone to the point that I'll go out on lunch breaks, you know, I'll eat my lunch, whatever, and then I'll go and putt for 45 minutes and go back mm. to the office. And that's, you know, that's a, a much better practice regiment than I've ever had. So. Yeah. I, w- I was just curious, like the break in the MA, th- for me, I feel like there's, if you're in MA3, the people that are really beating you are the people that are putting like very well consistently. Mm-hmm. So I was just curious how well, it sounds like you're doing pretty well with your putting, but because I, again, I think putting, if you're that confident at 25 feet, I mean, you can probably get to 25 feet to a lot of baskets with the way you're throwing, and that gives you a lot of birdie opportunity, a lot of like scoring opportunities against people that may, like me, I'm feeling shaky at 25 feet right now, so I may get there, but then I'm going to chain out and then not be confident for the next three holes, whereas you're just going to sink one and be like, okay, here's one stroke, here's one stroke, here's one stroke. So just curious. Sorry for the tangent, but I always like to kind of gauge where that like MA3 category is because I think there's a... <laughs> a collection of a lot of people in that, that competitive group. No, I, I think that's a very good point with the putting. And I, I do feel like I gain a lot of strokes in the field with the putting. The issue is that I lose strokes in the field off the tee. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so there's, as Robbie mentioned, there's a ton of variety in the courses around here. Mm-hmm. My home course right now, the one right by my work is Swanee Creek park. 
you know, the, the furthest hole might be 330 on most layouts. Yeah. A lot of the time it's like 210, 220. And those I can get close to and make the putt. The issue is if I'm competing somewhere different, if I'm going to Chattahoochee Point or Kirkerson, anything like that, where the average hole length's 370, mm -hmm. I know I'm not getting there. Like that's, that's a par at best for me. And so that's yeah. where I'll get beat by eight strokes is these people who can throw it 370 and make a 15 footer rather than, you know, 280 and hope for a hundred foot throw in. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. So Did I get muted? No. no I, okay. Nope. Okay. No, you're good. I was like, I don't know why I can't see it. Uh, I do Chattahoochee point to Swanee Creek is <laughs> such a draft. My first time playing both of those courses, I played them back to back. We started at Swanee. And it is it very much, I would say it's like a hybrid Brad of the mm -hmm. back nine of peaks view. Okay. So between shorts and longs, yeah, like it is cause the shorts at peaks, it's like the last, there's like seven holes in a row that are all 140 feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, but then the longs, it jumps up and they're all 250 feet. And so it mm -hmm. yeah it literally it's right in there but i think that, that there's a little more elevation at swanee uh mm -hmm. swanee has some like weird hills and everything and then there's you get to chattahoochee point and it's like chattahoochee point is holes uh one two three four five at uh sandy mm -hmm. so when you get that like big super yeah. on the creek yeah and then uh or maybe that yeah that's four uh but four five six seven eight nine ten yeah that's chattahoochee point where you're huh. just like ripping and yeah. it's like somewhat open field there's a couple gaps you gotta hit on some yeah. holes but right well there's some mean ones in there hole seven at chat point is two gaps you have to hit that are 100 feet apart and so you're like yeah i hit the first one and then you go straight into the wood line whack ah uh, okay. yeah totally so. I also played – This is a, I'm pulling this up on my phone. I have a U-Disc score from this weekend. There's a new course down in Milledgeville called Walter B. Williams that was actually designed by Dave Feldberg. Okay. Oh, there we um, go. Front nine, there's a 140-foot hole, a couple 160-foots. It is just all in the woods. A couple of the holes have like a three-foot wide gap you have to hit. I was three down through eight on the front nine. Okay. The back nine, there's a 500 foot par three, a 430 foot par three, a 370 foot par three. And so I finished the round plus three. Wow. So it's, it's as soon as we get into these distance, as soon as we get open, that's yeah. when I go, uh Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm no longer in my comfort zone. Yeah. And that, yeah. I, I think Brad, y'all are both hinting around it, right? Like, and I was going to ask on, we talked about how we have some people that say approaches, mm -hmm. but when you know, at 25 feet. I feel confident, like I have an 80%, 70% chance of making it at 25 mm -hmm. feet. That makes approaches feel so much easier. Mm -hmm. And when you're, because yeah. there's way less pressure, I don't have to be under the basket. And you talk about MA3, that's why I feel like MA3 players mess up so often is because it's like, I can be really solid off the tee, but if I'm not within 15 feet, I'm not going to make the putt. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they're, they're stressing there. And even on those shorter holes, but yeah, then once again, you're coming up to, even if you know that 25 foot window is there at a 400 foot shot, it's like, I'm going to have to throw my perfect drive, which is still not going to be as accurate because I'm going for max distance. Mm -hmm. And then you add on, I got to throw another basically perfect approach to get inside this range. And then I still have to make the putt. Like right. there's just so much more stress on the higher end. So we definitely want to help with that for the suggestion today. Um, I know like to me, this is part of the fascinating part of where in the bag evolves as well is instead of so much time where we're just diving into disc, it's stalking through like strategy and strength uh, mm -hmm. of your game with people. So we appreciate the conversation, Gus. Uh, you have an incredible bag. Uh, <laughs> it is it's so wild. much what it is. It's wild. Oh, it's wild. It yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there, there's a lot of wild in here. Um, sure. So I am very excited. I'm like, it is, uh, let's see, AGL, Wild, uh, TSA, mm -hmm. and, and Premiere. Premier, yeah. 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 So, I just took a Premiere disc out. Yeah. 
my Ooh. my uh, my war Pigeon dove, or dove got the boot. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so let's talk. Uh, we're going to talk. Let's start with the acacias. Is one of those putting putter? Yes. Yeah, one of them is putting putter. Um, I'm. It's it's been funny the last year now that I'm feeling confident around the putting green because every putter I've tried, I'm like, ooh, this is good. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 me. It's my form, which has been changing. But so the acacia is what I'm currently putting with. I've been messing around with some numas from Thought Space Athletics. If it's a little windy, but most of the time it's acacias. Okay. And one of them is in a more premium plastic for throwing? Yes. One of them's a glow plastic. Okay. It is. This is what kicked out the war dove. Um, straight, no turn, no fade. If, if I juice it, I'll get some turn on it, but I can just, you know, point and click kind of putter. Yeah. I I got to test the Acacia in a proto version, and I loved it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was beautiful. It's, it's that what, wizard bottom. So. so, yeah, wizard bottom, and what's the top? The Ponderosa. Yeah, that's a little flippy putter from uh, AGL. Yeah, it does feel yeah. good. We have a few here at the warehouse. They 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 feel perfectly fine. So it's. Um, do you feel like they do have a, a little bit of extra glide? Do you feel that way? Absolutely. You know, with the push putting, that's I have to have something real glidey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've noticed that, especially with the acacias, nose angle on the putts make a ton of difference. If I leave mm-hmm. it like nose down, like some people prefer, I'm going to miss it low every single time. But if I put it just a little nose up, it'll, that's how I make those 40 footers. You know, it'll, it'll just glide all the way there and I don't have to really worry about it. Yeah. yeah. I think I can relate to that. And then I guess moving up here, we have the sea otter, which is <laughs> the envy of the wild people. Oh my gosh. The sea otter is the best disc ever made. I swear. I got to I gotta get you in contact with Christian. He just loves his sea otter more than anything. He's a guy that works here and I mean, he's a great putter and he's, he can throw the discs. So there's something, there's something to that. What do you, uh, have you tried any other like throwing putters and like what made you like, be like, Hey, the sea otter is amazing. So I've tried a couple. Um, I was recommended the sea otter a a good while ago. I think it's the first wild disc ever tried. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm also a big fan of Cole Redolin. So when he was throwing them, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get my hands on this, but it's, I'm trying to figure out the best way to put it. It's just best hand feel. I know you talk about hand feel a lot on the show, mm, that's true. but it, it's pretty shallow. It's on the shallow side, but it's not so shallow that it doesn't have glide. Mm, yeah. And for me, it's, it's just that right middle ground level of stability to where it's not going to fade into oblivion, but it's not going to turn over if I put it on a little Annie. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a great example, hole two at that Walter B. Williams, the new course, it is 207 feet straight downhill onto an island green. And so if I fade out left, I'm in the water. If I fade out right, I'm in no man's land. And so I know I can trust that I can put 210 feet of power worth on this sea otter and have it just go dead straight with just a little bit of fade at the end. So I think at this point, I'm sure there's other putters that do similar things. It kind of feels like a slightly shallower AVR X3. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can just, I, I trust it and I'm confident holding it on the tee, you know? As much fade as an AVR X3 is going to have, or a little straighter? My glow one, probably the premium plastic one, but I'm the, the one that I throw a lot is the base plastic one because it's nice and beat in at this point. Yeah. Um, so it's it's straighter than an AVR X3, at least that one is. The, the glow one's probably pretty close. Okay. Awesome. Now, I'll go ahead and jump into this, and this may take us up to the overstable side. You talked about how approaches are like forehand approaches are your go-to. Are you forehand approaching with the sea otter or are other discs jumping in for that? Most of the time, other discs are jumping in for that. Okay. Uh, that's so what, typically a backhand disc. Okay. So what discs are those forehand approaches? <laughs> so that depends on the distance and depends on how much room I have to work with. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you guys see the bag. So there's, there's a lot of overstable four and five speeds. Yeah, um, right. a lot of them I'm kind of messing around with right now, seeing which ones stick. The Baobab is just a hilarious utility disc for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a get out of jail scramble forehand roller kind of disc. That's a I've got 80 feet and behind it it's water kind of disc. Yeah, um, that's the yeah, my my hit it and stick it kind of disc. The Temple is the newest edition. This is one I I got recently and have been messing around with. This is. I'm trying to figure out the best way. It's the most neutral out of all of those. Mm. Um, it's not nearly as stable as the Baobab or the Beach, 
but it's going to get a lot more distance off the tee or if it's a longer approach than I would with the baobab. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what slot that's filling in for. The beach is just beef. You know, I have it in, I have it in base plastic, so I'm sure it could be even more overstable, mm-hmm. but, uh, um, it's something that I can trust. That I can put it on forehand. Even if I roll my wrist over, it's going to fight out of, and it's going to get a little more ground action than the temple would. And then the spruce is kind of the last one. Spruce is the only disc I will forehand off the tee. That is my okay. 200 foot. You know, I know where it's going to go. It's going to go dead straight for me on a forehand. So that is my, like, I don't, I don't remember the last time I backhand my spruce. It is almost forehand only. Okay. So. Do you have a little it, bit of Anheuser on your forehand? I, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. And that's how the, the spruce is just overstable enough that it'll fight out of it. It won't turn all the way over, but it's not yeah. going to fade a ton either. Hmm. So. Okay. It also has the hand feel of a zone that somebody sat on, which I know it sounds weird, <laughs> but I really enjoy. So, <laughs> so like, like a little like a, puddle toppy? No, but like the, it has the, the wing shape of a zone. Ah, just, just flatter and wider. Got right. it. Okay. Got it. So. That's a, that is a funny description. And I think that <laughs> it zone is, lovers are. I'm yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you, I mean, obviously you said it, and like it goes up to kind of like your Magnolia, which your Pathfinder, your Magnolia look like they're kind of fighting for each other's life there. <laughs> um, and then your Mana and your Douglas Fir are all the way over on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm just going to ask this because I was in like this scenario maybe like six months ago, probably. I'm going to guess that for a while you weren't throwing a ton of mid ranges and then you're like, Hey, mid ranges are pretty cool. And then now you're like looking at a bunch of them and you're not really sure what needs to stay and what doesn't. Am I correct? Oh, yeah. Call me out. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, I know I, there, there are a bunch of different names, but I, I recognize this phase without even having to like hear anything about it. Um, I guess what, what is really, I guess, how far into this are you? Like, are you like a couple months into figuring out your mid ranges or are you like a couple weeks? Like where are you at timeline? The Pathfinder Mana Douglas fur combo has been in my bag for at least a year, almost a year. Mm-hmm. Okay. The rest of them have been kind of new additions that I've been messing around with. Um, just as I'm really working on developing that forehand, especially mm-hmm. all the overstable stuff. Right. Um, and then trying out new courses, I find, you know, hey, I could use something real beefy here. It's windy, or I could use something that goes a little further than my Pathfinder, but not quite a Votum. Um, yeah, because I know, um, especially with like the distances you're talking about, and and for those of you who are, that are watching, you can see in his bag already. If we go up, jump up to like nine speeds, your nine speeds speeds seem very meticulously spaced out based on stability. Mm-hmm. So I guess um, that's probably going to be the next step. We're going to make some suggestions for you, so we might just like completely throw your whole world off here. But I think that, um, and again, not to jump ahead, Robbie, but we'll talk about it in a second. But I think there's some work we can do at the top end to simplify some stuff that I think maybe will help you on your journey to simplify your mid ranges. Am I too far off base there, Robbie? No, not at all. I, uh, I completely agree. And looking at this, one of the questions that I have on choosing the, like choosing the manufacturers that have made your bag. Uh, and as you're looking at these options, I will say that the recommendation we have today does not come from any of these three companies. Uh, somewhat well, yeah, somewhat. Uh, <laughs> one of them you know thought space obviously being manufactured by mvp we do have a gyro mm-hmm. disc in there uh so check that one off the bingo box mm-hmm. but we uh do you as someone who's throwing a lot of agl and when i say a lot of agl i mean the most I've there's the seen. most agl i've seen in a bag that is not from someone who's on team agl mm-hmm. uh are you on team agl nope. okay do you want to be on Team AGL? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say no if they offered. Okay, perfect. I'll talk to my guys. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the the like truly the Baobab. I have a special relationship with the Baobab because I saw it. I loved it. I got it in a box, or I got it in a players pack because I played at a tournament. The same tournament I'm playing in Griffin. Uh, the guy who runs it used to be on Team AGL, uh, and he had a Baobab that looked like he let his dog chew it for a little while, mm-hmm. and it was still just as ridiculously overstable um so what drew you to agl and do you throw any other gateway stuff i know obviously i I guess wild used to be with them and now they're off overseas Mm -hmm. 
Um, so they're actually also MVP now, I think. I know some of the premium plastic is. Um, so the <laughs> funny story about AGL, first things first, you know, I, I like the mission, you know, just the yeah. whole concept of, of you know, re- reforestation and, and slowing down anything like that. But uh, actually my, my AGL relationship started with Jesse from Trash Panda. Um, I started, so I, they do the disc swap every Christmas. Yep. Yeah. The Secret Santa. And I, the first year I did it was, I think, the first year he ran it. And I ended up getting Scrooge. I got nothing back. Mm. Um, oh, no. So I, I sent him an email. I'm like, hey, you know, I, I don't care. I, the whole point of this was for me to send someone else, you know, plastic I'm not going to use, keep it in, in being thrown. But I just want to let you know, like, nothing ever showed up. I don't know if you need to look into anything. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I got you. What's your address? And I said, whoa, that wasn't what I was expecting at all. But here you go. So he sent me a disc and a handwritten letter that said, Hey, sorry about all the confusion. Here's a Magnolia with the trash panda stamp on it. And I said, well, I've never touched AGL before, but sure. Let's give it a shot. And I loved it. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, I don't have it on me. It's in my, my closet of backups. It's been cycling in and out of my other Magnolia, but the, that was what kind of started that. And then I started looking into it a little bit. I also grabbed the next one I grabbed was the Douglas fir. That's the, other longest disc that's been in my bag. I love the Douglas fir as just a flippy, glidey approach, mid range ish. A um, little more understable than the mana. But those two discs kind of sparked this like, man, this is really good stuff. This is good plastic. It fits my hand well. It's a good mission. I might as well, you know, invest. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to trying out other brands. I'm not someone that needs to stick with these. But once I find a brand I like, I'm like, might as well explore it you know yeah mm-hmm. um, yeah i i love i'm with you i love that you get a seed from the trees um mm-hmm. like that's super cool uh and yeah i it's funny the ogs of trash panda will know that he ran multiple like yep. he ran with agl like i have a trash panda stamped um a drone downstairs that is incredible it's mm-hmm. so pretty uh, and it's on my, when the house is on fire shelf, like <laughs> right. I grab these discs. Um, so I, yeah, that's awesome. Let's talk fairway drivers. Um, because we have a disc in there that I actually, I sent your bag. One thing I like will do on occasion is with my birdie fam, I will send the bag to the birdie fam and be like, all right, guys, let's see how you're doing. Mm-hmm. What would you recommend here? Uh, and they were like, oh, well, the war bear, he needs something flippier than the war bear. Yeah, yeah. And I was like thinking to myself, none of these guys have thrown a war bear, <laughs> but premier disc sponsored vlogmas for me a couple of years ago. And so I got introduced to premier that way and have thrown a lot of their stuff. Uh, I had a war pigeon. I putted with war pigeons for about five months, um, like here for it, putted with them, bagged them. It was a whole time. Uh, so I'm familiar with the war bear. Please let people know how did this South Dakota disc end up in your bag? The stamp. <laughs> that's, that's the reason. Uh, I, I, somebody had recommended premier disc that I followed on Instagram. I, I think they were sponsored by it. And I saw, Ooh, it's, it's it, right when it came out was the war bear. So I, I, I saw that it was a flippy seven speed. I'm like, I, you know what? I need one of those. And I bought it and it hasn't left my bag since it it's interesting compared to other seven speeds. It ended up replacing a latitude 64 mall for me. Yeah. Um, the okay. mall similar flip, you know, there, there's similar levels of understable. The war bear fights out at the tail end a lot more than the mall does. So if I throw the mall, it's going to drift right the entire time. And it's mm-hmm. just going to either keep going right or maybe straighten up at the end. If I give the war bear time, it'll fight out and come back fade at the end mm. so get a, a full i can release it flat and it'll get a full s line by itself which could be exciting uh What's at this? Times. i mean that's that's really important yeah no that is that's fascinating if i'm dropping a disc with anyone the war owl is coming uh yep. and a war owl. <laughs> i i it's it's not in it's not actually like i'm not saying that as a oh it's it, but they would be who I drop the mold with, um, mm-hmm. most likely. Uh, although birdie blend existing, the doors are open. Maybe I'm an AGL guy, uh, and I, I find some like 
some tree that an owl sits in. It would be great. Uh, <laughs> all trees, all trees. But uh, okay, so that's fantastic. Let's talk about the votum and how's the votum fly for you. The votum is just my consistent overstable explorer slot. Um, it's not going to have a ton of turn, but it won't have a huge like dump fade at the tail end. Mm-hmm. Um, Sequoia Park up in Canton, Georgia. There's a whole, I think it's twelve. Uh, it, it's just a it's it's a dog leg, but it's the world's slowest dog leg where it just fades left the entire time. Mm-hmm. And so the basket's eighty feet left of where the tee's pointing. But if you have something that dumps out, you're going to get real early and get into just some nastiness at the left. So that's where the votum will come in, where I can throw it and I can trust that it's not going to just dump. But I know that I'm not going to turn it over. I know that it's going to have that reliable fade at the end. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like it reminds me of like a C-Line FD flight just off the shelf. That's basically sure. what you want. Yeah, like a this that's not going to turn on you, but it's going to go relatively straight and have a gentle fade out for the, like the last 40% of the flight. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Sequoia is so good. I love that course. Sequoia uh-huh. was where I learned to play. And so I did not like it for a long time. <laughs> I hit so many trees out there that it, it forced me to understand how to hit gaps. So. Shout out to my boy, Zach. Uh, Zach plays out there all the time. And then uh, I Dylan is who I ended up like playing out there the most because that's Dylan Cease uh, is wow. in that area. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I have I've witnessed a lot of tree hits. Let me just say <laughs> that. Uh, so, uh, OK, let's let's just jump into drivers, shall we, Brad? Uh, like let's get there my because we're gonna we're gonna talk about a suggestion for this but i i've got like this theory in my head and i had a theory formed gus looking at your bag asking you a couple questions off air uh and but i want to i want to hear what these five discs up top do for you uh so brad if you're cool with it i think we just let him run for a second yeah because I'm curious too. Because in my in my mind, they're not doing a ton different for you, other than maybe like the Omen. Yeah, no, that's that's totally fair. Um, the Locust and the Construct fight with each other all the time because the Locust is a glidey son of a gun, and the Construct for me isn't. Um, mm. So that's that's something that there's a lot of overlap with the Hyena and the Money Tree. I thought we're going to overlap more than they do. Um, okay. My Hyena. My most thrown driver, I would say. Um, I sent you guys a video of my my form, just throwing at that Walter B. Williams Park again. That the disc I was throwing was a hyena, just because it's you know it's uphill. Want something a little understable that'll get up to two eighty five. That's going to be the hyena. Um, mm. Not super flippy, but not a ton. Not basically no fade for me. Um, I would say it's a longer war bear, but it is a pretty different flight. The money tree from AGL. I got that because it was, a, again, it was a new disc. I'm like, ooh, I want to try it. I actually got my hands on a prototype, which I don't know how I got my hands on a prototype, but I got my hands on a prototype. They lied to me. Um, <laughs> they, they told me they told me that this was going to be flippy. It's not. Mm-hmm. So That's funny. It, it feels like it's going to be flippy. Hand feels a roadrunner. And so I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. It's, you know, I might kick my hyena out of the bag. It rivals my locust. I mean, there's a little bit of turn, but it is it is not understable. <laughs> so, I like it in, in issues and like if there's danger on the left, it's not going to fade quite as hard as a locust or a construct would. Mm. And so, but it is it is my least thrown driver because normally, if I need something flippy, I'll go hyena. If I need something stable, I'll go locust. This is kind of a, a middle ground that comes out when it needs to, um, but not not super common. And then the omen, yeah, that's that one's. You guys said it that it does its own thing. That thing's just a, it's board flat, and it is a beefcake and a half. So. Yeah. I think there was a while where Hunter was trying to bag the omen mm-hmm. in his like Firebird mm-hmm. alternative slot. So yeah, I, I definitely. I mean that the thing is. Yeah, an anomaly. We know what it does. It, yeah. it fades. Uh, it doesn't matter yeah, which way else. you throw it. It fades and it skips. Um, 
And that's that is completely okay, just to have. Some people I think are going to look at it and be like, "I'm that's so crazy, dude." Yeah. Uh, like, there are some people who are going to be like, "Oh yeah, well if you're only throwing two ninety, like, why do you need to have that just in your back at utility?" Probably not coming out very often at all. You probably like once every three rounds, I would imagine. It, it's a good round out. if I don't touch it. Yeah. The issue like, is when I need to touch it, I have to have it. You know, absolutely. It, it is a. I use it for thumbers. I'll use it for forehand rollers, any kind of goofy recovery shots if I'm out in the junk. Yeah. So it, I, I don't want to use it, but I, it, I have to sometimes. Yeah. My so. my personal in the bag comes out on my channel uh, tomorrow. It will have come out yesterday when people hear this live. Mm -hmm. uh, but I talk about my uh, – I've got a Lucid X Glimmer Felon that is a mini tilt, uh, and it is in that same slot. And I'm like – it's my least thrown disc in my entire bag, but there are just times where you need it. And my justice fills a similar slot to the Baobab where it's like, there are just times where you need it. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, you're going to be ticked. So, uh, okay. So here's, here's the theory, Gus, is right now from, and you can tell me if this is way off before we dive into, because maybe this will help Brad with like, as you're approaching and sharing about the disc we tried uh, at 250, like when you're 250, 260 on an off day, 290 on a good day. So there's 40 feet of difference there, which is a significant jump. Let's just mm -hmm. go ahead and say that. Like, mm -hmm. because even with 25 foot putt, like 25 foot putts, you're stepping up. And if it's a 300 foot hole, now I have to make a 40 footer versus I'm making a 10 footer. That's a tap in kind of a deal. Right. So I would imagine on those days where it just feels like you're not getting enough, those that hyena isn't as flippy as you need it to be that day because you want the easy distance. The locust is definitely going to be way too overstable there. But trying to mush like your magnolia or your pathfinder out to 300 feels like an impossible journey. 100%. So now we're looking at the war bear to kind of help maybe fill the slot. But you can't really trust the war bear because if you maybe yam on it too much on those days, it is going to turn and it's barely going to fade back. But the Votum, as we've already discussed, has more stability. It's not like an incredible – it's not a, just a super neutral disc. Yeah, right. So what do, what do you do with your bag as it's currently set up when you're not feeling it that day because none of your discs really want to help you succeed when you're having it when you're on this bag is perfect yeah it's doing exactly what you want to everything you know what it's doing uh when you're off questionable so i really thought about suggesting something between the votum and the war bear or even maybe something flippier than the war bear um but we literally talked about that last week it was something flippier than the war bear we talked about the ver vortex and the f7 mm -hmm. um which are two possible alternatives if you want that extra flip. But it sounds like I also, and it's funny because you said mall and I saw Brad's eyes like perk up a little bit because I literally yeah. suggested the mall as one of the options to the two discs that we actually threw last week. Um, so you could put the mall back in and I, I'm honestly going to suggest putting the mall in over maybe the money tree or the locust or the construct or something like that. Like if you're going to pull one of them out, put them all in so that you have that extra turning slot if you yeah. need it. So to me, fleshing out the seven speeds and the eight speeds could be a really valid, like filling that area of the bag out because they're just going to be significantly easier to throw. Mm -hmm. Personally, I love the stalker. I think the cicada is sneaky good um a disc that is gyro plastic so you're not stepping to away that i tried yesterday the servo y'all good dirty that good. disc is dirty uh i threw a servo 380 something feet yesterday like literally my first time out with it and it wasn't like oh i threw it on this crazy flex line annie i it was a bullet for the full 380 like dirty i i'll go ahead and say it i'm getting close to the camera for our audio listeners which is why my voice got a lot louder i think it's a better crave bold 
Yep, that's come at me, gyro nerds. I it is it's so good. So it's not going in my bag, but it is it because I have it the stalker that does the exact same thing. Um, and I'm already familiar with it. But y'all, if I would have found the servo first, that stalker doesn't stand a chance. Mm-hmm. So, like, definitely I would suggest flushing those out. Now we're going to sound with all of that said, does that make sense? Gus, does that sound like it resonates with problem days at all? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. That's when, when I'm when something's not clicking, you know, I catch myself going back to bad habits. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't touch my nine speeds and I certainly can't touch that construct cause I know it's just going to fade out way too early. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I do, I do rely a lot on, jamming out really the mana is kind of my my go-to like uh uh-oh not feeling it today um because with the mana it's not it's not super flippy for me you know even on a on a good day it's just kind of straight um so on on a day that something's not clicking i'll I'll just fall back on that as a get out of jail free you know take your time get your head in the game kind of disc Mm -hmm. okay so brand you're a you're a nine and ten speed guy yeah. You like you're starting to work some drivers back in, mm-hmm. uh, but talk about with this theory is that makes sense? Or is it making more sense on why we picked what we picked today? Yeah, because I think what yeah it does make sense, and I kind of alluded to this in the live stream. Thanks to those of you who jumped in. Gus was also in the live stream this morning, even though it didn't work half the time. Because um, I, I think what would be really interesting as like an experiment after our recommendation is like leave your omen in there, like says so that your get out of jail disc, but literally take the locust construct money tree hyena just out for a minute. Because I think what we're going to suggest to you is going to like fill that like distance driver like need. But I think both of these discs, and I think I already know which one I'm going to recommend, Robbie. But I think the one I want to recommend is going to be a very like a disc that is like a swiss army knife for you that can like get you comfortable with all that without feeling like oh it's a bad day i'm not getting my max distance so i've got to jump down to my seven speeds or my four speeds sure you know what i mean that i mean hopefully that aligns with what you're thinking robbie for his top end yeah so what do we recommend so i threw the vision wave today um this particular one is 168 i also threw one that is 156 just for those of you at home and then I also threw uh, Z Light Thrashers. They are both 158 as well. And Thrashers a 12 speed, Wave is an 11 speed. So immediately, here's where the internet is looking at us, and I can I can see you guys. Just, I can hear it. I can, I th- yeah, I can hear listen, the clicks listen. and the clacks of the keyboard going. Wait a minute, you're telling this man to take his nine and 10 speeds out you're putting 11 and 12s in there what are we doing (laughs) but i love the swiss army knife comment that brad has mentioned so uh brad like what how did how did they like these are two they they're distance drivers they're going to be distance driver rims how does that feel hand wise for distance driver rims yeah, so for me, I, I said this in the live stream too, or the live. Um, my problem's always been like a 12 speed is extremely comfortable in my hand. Like a bigger rim, feel, I have bigger hands, like so a bigger rim feels better in my hand. And But I usually cannot get those discs up to speed so they do not fly as intended. And I'm not seeing a di- any distance gained with going up into that 11, 12, 13 speed area. But they both feel great in the hand. Backhand, they both feel great in their own respect. The only thing I did note today during the live was um, on forehand, the wave is like significantly less comfortable than the thrasher in my in my hand. Um, and someone pointed out, I don't remember who it was, but the wave is like slightly more shallow. And I think that's why my hands just feel a little crammed. And like this partic- the particular um, rim shape doesn't sit, like have that seat back in my hand like I like it to be. So mm. for whatever it's worth, but they both feel good, especially on backhand. Like it's not like one feels better than the other. Um, I mean, I guess if I had to give the winner to one, the thrasher, but it just, I like a little bit bigger rim. So that's the only reason I would give it to the thrasher on hand feel. Okay. Um, yeah. And I typically don't love fission plastic, but this fission plastic feels good. It doesn't feel slick to me, which it normally does. Um, Cause it's funny. I'm one of those weird guys. Like 
I like Z to some people is like very slick in their hand. To me, it's like real grippy. Um, and fission is like the opposite is usually slick. And I know people typically are opposite of me, but, uh, this particular run of fission does not feel slick to me. Okay. So you get out there and we're looking for the goal was Swiss army. And when we're going to throw distance, let's throw distance mm -hmm. and let's find easy distance. Right. Did these discs help accomplish those things? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think. Wave is definitely easier distance in my experience throwing them, even like the field work today and the what I've thrown the wave before. Like the wave just is it's it's funny. I mean it's that gyro thing. It's like I can I release on a little baby hyzer, it'll like the wave will flip up real easy for me. And it does it'll turn a little bit, but it won't turn a lot. It just very little, depending on the weight. Now the lighter weight one would definitely turn on me. People saw that today. But this like even that 165, it'll flip up. It'll go pretty straight. It may drift a little to the right, um, but it'll, it'll have like a nice steady fade at the end, which is cool. Like not a lot, just a little bit, um, but very easy just to pump out there, get it like rotating and get distance. I was saying I was throwing them like around 300 during the live. I actually went out and measured it because I'm like, man, I may have just told everybody I threw way farther than I did. I actually shorted myself. I was throwing them all like 320 um, the whole time. And that's with like not trying to kill it. When I did try to kill it, people on the live saw like I, I grip locked this wave over into like the next like property line. Um, I did. I mean, I did throw it like 360 feet, but I did throw it like what not even close to where I was trying to throw it. Um, Thrasher is great. I will say the only thing about the Thrasher coming to the Swiss Army conversation is like. I feel like I know the Thrasher well enough because I've used to bag a Thrasher that I kind of know like its characteristics and I can probably make a little bit more out of it. But. If you're just like, this is your first time throwing a Thrasher, even a Z light one, it might be a little more temperamental. It does. I do feel like you can tell the difference between the 12 speed and the 11 speed on the Thrasher. Like I do have to get a little more of a pump to get it to turn. I do have to get a little more of a pump to flip up. And again, it's probably the Z plastic too. Um, and it does have a little bit of sn sneaky stability onto it still, even at 158, it still does have that. Um, you, I will say you can throw more flex lines because it does have that tick more stability. It's like not as temperamental there, um, but still in with the wave, it's going to give you a lot of alternatives too. Um, forehand, I expected the Thrasher to be a little bit better than it was. Uh, have a little more flip up because I used to forehand the Thrasher exclusively and it really didn't. It still like I give it my forehand quite a bit of hyzer. And mm -hmm. it just held that line. It would maybe flip up a little bit. Whereas the wave um, would flip up and kind of carry that hyzer. And like even the blue wave where it was so light would flip up and turn a little bit on me and then kind of fade back. I actually threw this blue wave like 300 feet on forehand multiple times. Um, so, and that's measured distance. So, I don't know. Very interesting. Now, I didn't like it as much. It didn't feel as good in forehand, but like the flight characteristics were better. Um, and then I tried some Annie lines too, just for the people. Um, Robbie, I almost called you Leroy because I just literally read your name, but, Hi. Uh, but I'm I here threw, for it. I threw some Annie shots. Um, I will say like this blue wave where it was lighter um, could easily be a roller disc. Like it would take little to no effort for me to like figure out what the roller angle is on it. Now the the yellow one, which is a little heavier, Still, like, I didn't have to give it a lot of ante to give it encouragement to, like, carry that Anheuser line, but it, I could give it an angle where it would, like, carry the ante line and then start to flatten out at the end, which I think is, like, a really nice shot to have and have a disc that will do that for you. Mm. Thrasher was more of, like, um, it would have, like, a, an actual, like, S line. It would just, you know, it would turn, it would hold that Anheuser, but not as long, and it would come and fade back. Um, I did throw my far farthest shot of the day with the Thrasher. I threw it, like, 355 um like an actual like straight line shot um but the waves were never far behind they were always in that 320 ish but i felt like i had a little bit more control there's a little less variability probably with the wave um so yeah i feel like easy distance wave wins i feel like forehand even um i know you're an anheuser thrower on forehand so that concerns me maybe a little bit um but hey, you may just not forehand it. That's okay. Because there's a lot of other backhand shots you can throw. You can throw a straight line that'll like turn a little bit, but it's like a controlled turn. You can 
Heiser flip it. And even on Annie, you can learn that angle and throw it and get kind of a nice like left to right shot if you like maybe don't feel like you have a big forehand that day. So I, I feel like um and what I really I think would like to recommend or send him, Robbie, I want to yeah. send you both of these waves because I think we can do start a little bit of like mold minimalization because I think the orange wave and the blue wave are going to fly a little differently for you. Mm. And that blue wave is going to have a little bit more like turn and give you a little bit more of that understable like feel without having to go to a different disc. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, Gus, but you weren't forehanding any of your nine and 10 speeds really before anyways, right? No, not unless absolutely necessary. <laughs> so, well, then that might be a good point, Robbie. I mean, it might actually, you might like the flight of it then you might like that blue one because you're not going to throw it very hard to get it to flip up. Yeah. I so figured I, I wasn't rolling over my five speed spruce. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, even though it is a little bit handy, I don't put a ton of power behind my forehand. So yeah, that's that might be a, a good utility shot. Yeah. So Gus, do you have experience with the wave in the past? I think I've thrown a wave once and it was okay. many, many years ago. So it, it, I think it was the first distance driver I ever tried. And at that time I was not ready. So yeah. in my head, I'm like, man, waves are really overstable. But then I realized I was throwing it 150 feet probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> hey, it probably was overstable at 150 feet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There, uh, no doubt there. Right. So, uh, Gus, if we sent you these waves, would you be willing to come on and let us know? I mean, we'll send them regardless. I'll uh, go ahead and <laughs> yeah. say that. But would you be willing to come back and uh, let us know how they fly for you? Uh, heck yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate it. Yeah, come no on, well, dude, Gus. We appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, looking forward to having you on a future episode. Yeah, thanks, guys. A G L from the A T L. I, dude didn't even make that connection what that's that's next level brad yeah, next well, level i mean you know if you have it you have it that's yeah. what i've always that's what my mom's always said guys agl has some sneaky good discs i'm just yeah. saying and the names are incredible manzanita uh i know my Bayo guy tai Real, yeah. relatos tai uh uh content creator he's doing i don't know what he's doing i don't know if he's still doing full-time content creation or not but he was crushing it he was an agl guy for a long time but in manzanita mondays uh for a little time That's so fun. I like agl it, cooking it makes me think of minecraft all the different wood types and tree types that's what it made it just it gives me that vibe i wanted to throw the casey just because of that but you know here we are Dude. um so no i that was a really interesting episode it's always fun to that's maybe one of the most unique bags we've had for sure the de- unique brands and it's always cool to talk about that because i'm not super familiar with agl i'm sure most people aren't and hey there might be some stuff out there that you can give a try um it's so. it's one of the first bags that i feel like we've had that in a long time that people could like when that pops on the screen and they're seeing it on disc rpm they're like okay i've heard of the pathfinder mm-hmm. And that might be the only disc that I've like heard people bagging. Yeah. And the the mana is yeah. g- gaining popularity. Uh, yeah. But like, wait, wait, a hyena? What the heck is that? Yeah. <laughs> Mufasa, 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 Mufasa. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's all I could think about when I saw it. Um. But no, I think I think it's great. It's great to give people a new experience with different discs and stuff like that. And um. So while well, speaking of experiences with different discs, Ooh. Robbie. Um, I've, I'm on this trend right now. I've been sending you boxes of random stuff. It seems like for the last, sure last couple of weeks. So, um, sent you down a box of some, uh, some stuff, but I also sent you this month's subscription box. So how do you feel about that? Dude. So I, one of my favorite part, my favorite part about the subscription box is the thought that goes behind the theme. Um, because the themes have been like truly kind of all over the place. Uh, and that's, I, when people hear all over the place, they're like, they can think that's a bad thing. I actually think it's incredible because I would really struggle with, and I'm not like if a pro had a subscription box where they were sending out different discs each month, Mm -hmm. to me, it would be really hard for that pro to, and I, I'm not like trying to throw shade because I'm not a part of any pro subscription boxes. So I'm hoping that they're this way. Uh, but I could just, I find, I think it would be hard for it not to just be like, Oh, here's my stock stamp disc. Here's this like, Mm -hmm. and obviously with that pro, it's all going to come from usually one company, uh, and that company. Okay, cool. What if I just don't really love half of the lineup of that company? So at foundation, obviously we have the freedom to do literally anything. 
Uh, we can work with all gateway. We can work with, we can have an AGL box. Uh, and it's like, we stand in the shade of trees that we have yet plant or that like that we did not plant. Uh, and it's an all AGL box. All right, yeah. cool. Awesome. Like there's so much freedom that we have. And so you have last month's box, uh, was the five year anniversary box. Yeah. So we had Discraft, we had prodigy PA threes that, uh, like, I mean, I love my wizards, but the PA three is a phenomenal putter that yep. I think forces you to commit. Uh, and then we had, what was it? Leopard threes. Well, was, it depends. No, no it depends. that was Christmas. Well, it depends. You might've got a halo leopard three, but it was a variable, like one line custom stamped Innova, just variable. There were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was like T-Bird. eight or nine molds. Yeah. Yeah. So like there was there's a host of things that you could have gotten which is also sick that like if you have multiple friends that go in on uh like boxes you guys can trade around which is really cool well this month's box the theme to me is the most important theme that we've had in a box yet which is point and shoot field work trying to go improve because we mentioned on the podcast today going and practice putting can feel really boring for lots of people mm-hmm. if you've got that itch like personally, I could practice putt for hours every day and not get bored at all. It's mm-hmm. so satisfying to me. But I understand that some people don't do that. Field work is a lot harder for even me to get out and want to practice like distance field work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like upshot field work. And so this month's box point and shoot came out so beautiful. And the disc choices inside of it were phenomenal. We've got a custom stamped judge that yep. is gorgeous uh and not just a judge emac, EMAC judge mm-hmm. which is a difference and y'all premium plastic emac judges are not easy to find right so like you're getting a sick disc that like legitimately you could probably sell to cover like even if you didn't love it you could probably sell that emac judge on the disc golf market to cover at least half the box because right. they're so hard to find. Mm-hmm. So instantly I'm like, game on. Then you take me to a Katrina Allen rift. Yep. Beautiful. That new stamp is awesome. Guys, it's so pretty and it flies. It's, it's what a buzz wants to be. What people describe a buzz as is what the rift does. Mm-hmm. And conveniently made in the same plastic. The buzzes are made in. Yeah. So we're cooking. Uh, and then fairway driver. Okay. Here's where I'm blanking because I got FD. so excited on the other two. The FD, which is also, obviously, we're big fans of it here for mm-hmm. in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, spoiler alert. We'll talk about those in a second. But like yep. the FD, sneaky good as well. And so right there, if the box just stops, Brad, you're like, cool. That's a phenomenal box. Completely worth it. Mm-hmm. But wait, there's more. Swag item, guys, I I used to, my mom used to have to drop me off at car shops because I was a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh player. So I'm all about the trading card game, mm-hmm. all about the Pokemon trading card game. Got to have them all, got to catch them all. And now Brixton is changing the disc golf card game, but it's like, all right, cool. What if I, you know, I don't know this pro, I don't know this pro, but mm-hmm. content creators you love, got to be the bogey bros. And Brixton Foundation Disc Golf collab yeah, if you're a visual folk, you can see it right now. You hear that's in a hard case too, Robbie. The packaging's great, which is cool. And I'm not going to show the people this. I'm just going to show you the back of the card. But there, are, there's rumor that there's maybe like one to four variations of this card. But you'll never know. Maybe you will. So, if you're a card collector, might be your box. And you know, who knows? Maybe we'll do more of these. Yeah, y'all. It's it was such a cool box. So I I love the subscription box. I think it is super cool. It's forty five dollars a month. You get three discs. At least one of them is custom stamped. And when I say at least one of them, we've been on a tear lately because the beautiful part is because so many people are buying into the subscription box. It allows us to do more cool things Mm -hmm. with a subscription box. So uh, I mean, I can think of multiple months in the last three months. So there you go. Yeah. that have had multiple custom stamp discs. Yeah. And these aren't, this isn't just how we're clearing out our overstock. We're like thinking about these boxes. We're putting them together. 
you know, like Robbie said, there's a theme, there's a reason we're just like sending these out. This is not just garbage we're trying to clear out of our warehouse. We're ordering everything specifically for these boxes to try to give you the most bang for your buck, make you the value be, well exceed the $45 and then give you a cool swag on them. This can be, you know, custom Brixton collabs. This can be patches. They can be minis. They can be towels. They can be whatever. Um, so again, if you, if you're not onto that service yet, it's probably time to do it, especially, Hey, it's spring and summer. You're going to be out throwing new discs and things like that. Um, so yeah, make sure you check those out. They're, they're one of my favorite things to do. They're a lot of work because again, we're doing them with purpose, but, um, we're always planning and trying to make the the next one better and the next one better. So we yeah. appreciate all of you that are on that now. And just, if you haven't tried it out, it's going to be a good month to try. Dude. And I even like, truly, I think about the fact that like, you talk about patches. Some people are like, oh, patches are like, but these patches were dropping like inside the boxes and they're staying inside the boxes. Like yeah. I have my Robbie C key patch that was in the Robbie C box. And we had a couple, like we had some extras. And so I have those that I put on my bag. And at this point, the only way to receive a Robbie C key patch is you have to see me in person. And I have to have not given away the patch that's currently like, my in the bag that I talk about dropping tomorrow. Uh, I had given away one of my patches and I forgot about it. So I shot the hole in the bag and there's just a blank spot on my That's patches. Uh, yeah. And I was like, what a fool. What a fool. <laughs> so um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Speaking of some cool stuff that we also dropped, we have, uh, and I guess this kind of transitions us to what's new in the warehouse, but like y'all, we just dropped in the bag discs which are incredible. We have disc mania is what in the bag ended up with. And I'm stoked mm -hmm. about it because there's two disc mania molds that Brad and I love together. Uh, we got the FD that Brad was just yeah. showing uh C line FD phenomenal. And then we have some Neo origins that are yeah. also incredible. I finally got to throw mine and those are tasty. Those origins. I saw you throw them too, Robbie, but the, I mean, they're just so great off the shelf great run of origins great run of fds these the fds i had were like a little flip to them already which is great because i took some of the other ones out and now i'm just like cycling sea lines now which is a great place to be in and also the other podcasts those small podcasts we have grip locked and tour life as well if you've ever heard of those ones dude i'm legitimately shocked that there are jawbreaker zones still there yeah i i don't know how that happened um but they're, they're all beautiful, every one of them. They're all so cool. I love the Jawbreaker zones because they beat in pretty quickly. And yeah. they give you that nice like flip up or straight zone that still has the zone finish, which is mm. pretty awesome. Um, so on top of that, oh, also, I didn't bring any over to my desk. What a fool to use what your fool? line, Robbie. Uh, in the bag, Minis. in the bag, Tour Life, Grip Locked, and Robbie C minis are dropping this week too. Come so, on. Hey, and then we got some one other final custom item on the way. They're being in they're in production right now. We'll have them in like a week and a half. Um, very excited about those too. But hey, we're dropping some custom stuff about every week now, which is great. But make sure you take those mini. Um, I didn't realize it was Robbie until Jason told me, but um, there are actual UV minis in this batch, which we've never had before okay so there's like glow and there's uv which is awesome and there's some crazy swirls in there so grab a mini as you're grabbing an in the bag fd or origin make sure you pick up a, a in the bag mini as well we also have a bunch of um gyro going back up on the site finally have a not a full restock but a restock of quite a few molds and we have isaac who joined the team this week he's been uh putting up some new mold kimberly's at the house putting up molds in between putting the baby down for a nap. We're trying to get all these up uh, for you guys as quick as possible because we have disc craft going up. We also have the Ursus from Terminal Velocity, which we've never had on the site. Yes, sir. And I will say my Quake is in trouble because that disc is sick. Um, so I'm trying to decide, Robbie, if I want to just really commit to like not changing my bag or if I'm kicking the Quake out. I have not made the decision yet. <sighs> Um, but yeah, Trumbo, shout out, uh, Wes, who has been, uh, telling me about the Ursus for like, I don't know what, two years now. And I know he loves it. He even gave me one that he died and 
I didn't really have a use for that disc at that time, but now that overstable mid range has become like something I really love. So I'm very excited to put that disc in, in my bag as well. So a lot of new, a lot of new restocks, a lot of stuff going up. Uh, stock pixels are up now. So, um, a lot of stuff for you to choose from a lot of great discs up on the site, a lot of great accessories up on the site. So whether it's on your bag or in your bag, if it's good, keep it there. We will see you all next week for episode 97. Can't believe we're there. 97. See y'all next week.